we gather together to draw attention to an issue that is as vital to the future of this country as any that we face. Calvin Coolidge once said, the government of a country never gets ahead of the religion of a country. Fostering the faith and character of our people is one of the great trusts of responsible leadership. And the relentless drive to eliminate God from our schools can and should be stopped. R.L. Dabney once predicted that Christians must prepare themselves for the following results. All Bibles, prayers, and catechisms will ultimately be driven out of the schools. And we look at that today and say, there were catechisms in the schools? I believe that Christian education is mandatory. 24 years ago, my first son was born and I was teaching uh, remedial math in a junior high and high school in California. Uh, so kids who hated math, hated school, hated me, and, and I was doing my best. You know, I was trying to make a difference. And I looked at my classrooms, and I looked at my newborn son, and I knew that the last place on earth I wanted my son to be was in one of my classrooms. Someone said you spend roughly 12,000 hours in school from the time of kindergarten until you graduate high school. And you can't outsource that sort of important formational time to people who do not share your deepest convictions. You cannot outsource that important formational time to people who think that it doesn't matter. You know that when you drop your child off at school, that that teacher believes what you believe and is going to back you up on what you are telling them at home. That is so important. If you simply, thoughtlessly send your kids to the secular progressives for an education, they will return your children to you as strangers. I was out of the Navy, married, had a child, and one day Nancy said to me, Doug, I can't see handing Becca over to someone we don't know, saying here she is, educator. And I didn't know anything about Christian education except that I agreed with that. So I, I told Nancy, don't worry, we'll have, we'll have a Christian school started by the time Becca hits kindergarten, I said rashly. When we started Logos School, I'll say at the outset, it helps to be crazy. <laughs> Our movement keyed off of Dorothy Sayers essay, The Lost Tools of Learning. And that's what her whole essay was about. What are the tools of learning? And she suggested going back to the medieval trivium, grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric. Why don't we match up the medieval trivium, grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric with three stages of child development that she called the uh, Paul Parrott stage, the Pert stage, and the poetic stage. And she said, kids naturally go through these stages. Let's just cut with the grain. And we were all ignorant. We don't know what we're doing. We might as well try this. Dorothy Sayer says in that article, no one will ever be crazy enough to attempt what I suggest here. But, but we were. Doug approached me in the Christian bookstore downtown one day and said, basically, would you be interested in heading up this Christian school? I, <laughs> I had no interest in the Christian school, and I was going to be an art teacher. And so I laughed at him, and, and he just said, well, pray about it. You know, and when Doug says that, that's just not fair. Then in 1991, Doug wrote the book, you know, Recovering the Lost Tools of Learning, and put that out there. And, <laughs> and it went crazy. We got phone calls, we got letters. You have to understand this is before the internet. But they wanted to start a Logos type of school, a classical school wherever they were. How do we do that, they said. So I mark that as the beginning of ACCS. Okay, we're not the only crazy ones. There are other people elsewhere in the country who are facing the same challenges that we are. There must have been a huge pinup demand for something different. For Christian schools that did scholarship really well, that did discipleship really well. And so you saw between the mid 90s and the mid 2000s, schools pop up all over the country. My 
wife and I, we, we happened to be in a town. I was the administrator of school, teaching graduate classes at a university, and she happened upon this book called Recovering Lost Tools of Learning. Oh, what a, what a wonderful uh, read that was for she and I to see something and go, ah, that's what I want for my kids. When you think about Christian schools, you think of, oh, academic is weak. And that to me, there's no room for that. If we're representing Jesus Christ, we want to do everything with excellence. Later in my life, I uh, went into education and uh, sought to avoid Christian education for that reason. And uh, then I finally discovered classical Christian education and realized Christian education can be done with rigor, with uh, great formation of the kids and not just be sheltering the kids, but exposing them to great things in life and teaching them how to think Christianly about all things and uh, so I didn't walk, I ran toward the classical movement. As I um, researched more and more options, I came across classical Christian education and had this eureka moment. I had read Recovering the Lost Tools of Learning and thought, where are schools like these? I would love to send my own child to one. And I was so dismayed to find that there were no such schools in San Diego at the time. And I tell people getting involved in classical Christian education, I warn parents when I interview them, you know, it's dangerous. Uh, it's easy to catch the vision. The dangerous part is when the vision catches you and it radically alters your life. I'm fond of saying that Christians need to become accustomed to that great two-word prayer, which is Geronimo, Amen. <laughs> this classical thing works. <laughs> so it's, whoa, praise God. So my options were either to homeschool or to move to another city that has such a school, which was not an option at the time, or to start a school. And so I don't know exactly how that happened, but I ended up starting my own school now 11 years ago. Tullock's Classical School was started in 1994. Uh, late in the summer, a bunch of homeschooling families got together and started the school in third through 10th grade and uh, expanded it to a K through 12 school quickly. Geneva School started in 1996 and we were planning to start the school in 1995 and within one year we were able to open the school with 22 students in New York City. People didn't believe that was gonna happen, but with God in the front of it all, he made it possible for us to start the school. Our first year, we only had 20 students with our trailblazing families that took the risk and came to a school, signed up for something, paid a deposit for a school that they could not see. We doubled the next year in size and we continued to grow exponentially. And next year, K-6, to we're well over 100 students. Veritas School started in 2000 with 50 students, a handful of families, committed families with a vision and a belief that uh, education could be different. It could be rich and robust in terms of the academics, but also a place of authentic Christian community. And God blessed it from the early years, some, some good growth like in lots of schools, but some normal challenges. We started with on 61st and 2nd Avenue. We've been in seven different locations. We're like the Israelites. <laughs> We probably really shouldn't even exist, but uh, we started our school with 28 children, kindergarten, first and second grade, and added a grade each year. This year we have 575 students, TK through 12th grade. The Lord provides. I mean, it's kind of funny that we fit perfectly in this building right now. One year we moved in the end of July uh, we were notified that we needed to move out of our current renting space and so we moved in two weeks and opened the school uh, two weeks later. And uh, To pack up and move a, a school of 150 people is hard. To pack up and move a house is hard, let alone a whole school. Move uh, 20 minutes away, open up and have the entire population of the school follow. We've always realized that the school is not a building, that the school is wherever there are people who love God, love the kids, love the mission and vision, and are working to make that mission and vision real in the classrooms on a day-to-day -day basis. We could do school under a tree. We could do school anywhere. We had the most humble campus 
modular buildings, a rented church facility. It was it was great. I mean, it's where God built the school. So you know, do not despise you know small beginnings. And like so many stories of classical Christian schools, we couldn't have imagined. God gave us a, a hundred-year-old campus. The building we're in today was built in 1922, almost a hundred years ago. When you line up all the events of how the school came together, it doesn't really add up and make logical sense that we pulled this off. Yeah, there was a couple times that that uh, Tall Oaks was threatened with closing his doors, but uh, God kept his hand on us and uh, a lot of people jumped in and wouldn't let that happen. NSA started very similar to most of the stories of every ACCS school. It started with some parents who said, we want better for our kids. It started with four students and a church community that wanted to really figure out how to do higher education better. Students that have this kind of education, they're putting themselves, they're qualifying themselves for a level of leadership that is exceptional. And those men, those women, they're gonna be the ones that are gonna be leading the culture in generations to come. So if you're a student at a classical Christian school, or you are a teacher or an administrator, a board member, staff, if you're a donor, a parent, a grandparent, or you have some kind of association with this movement, let me tell you this, the devil absolutely hates what you're doing. The world does not like what you're doing. Do not surrender. This is a work of God. It's in some ways kind of a second reformation. The Lord is behind it. This movement will be successful. It's already being successful. Remember, every day, souls are being formed. They are being bent towards Jesus Christ. They're learning to glorify Him. They're learning to love the church. They're learning to love the Word. And every grammar lesson, every book that is read, every poem, every piece of Latin that is parsed, all of these things make God smile. Don't miss the blessing. This type of education can be for every child. I wish that I would have been able to give this to all three of my kids. I'm glad that our daughter Rachel graduated from Trinity Classical Academy. She herself will tell you this changed her life. This made her the young woman that she is today. And that is not something that you can put any kind of a price tag on. And I was watching the early days of my first two boys year in the classical school. Startup school in its second year, you know, don't have it down. But I watched that school waken in my children a love of learning, a curiosity, a sense of wonder, and an appetite for what they were learning. And it was, I knew it was worth it. And I said to the principal, I walked in and I said, if I had to sell my house and move into a one bedroom apartment to afford this, I'll do it. My kids love being here. They love going to school. They love learning. It's not the typical response in school. Like I remember even one day I was outside in front of our house getting my kids in the car to drop them off and the neighbor walks by with their dog like, oh, you gotta go to school, right? What a drudgery that you're off to school. And I was thinking to myself, if only you knew. <laughs> my kids love going to school here. They love learning. There was this r remarkable moment one time when my oldest son was a junior in high school and we were watching a film and he turned to me in the middle of sort of this climatic moment of the film, this action adventure drama, and he said to me, Dad, I hate this, I hate this, I'm ruined. A and by that he meant, he wasn't able to just sit back and be a teenager watching an action flick. He was sitting there analyzing dialogue, philosophy, background, ideology. What are they trying to sell me? And I realized at that moment, that's it. That's, that's what we want. We want to train young men and women to think, to exercise discernment and to be ruined for the world. I think once our kids get that stage and we prepared them that they can go out to these universities that are godless and they're pagans and, and from a sense of a worldly sense and they can engage that culture and not be 
you know, beat down by it or be afraid of it or even made them look stupid because they won't be because they have been sharpened and they're ready to give an account. The gospel that our, our children are carrying will be an offense, but they shouldn't be. Whenever we just become another follower, we just become like the rest of the world. And that's not what a classical Christian education is preparing us to do. It's preparing us to be unique because when we stay grounded in what we believe, that's how change happens. What we found at Logos School is what we hope everyone finds at a classical Christian school. You find first and foremost Jesus Christ. And one of the reasons that many of us are here is because we're selfish. I mean, we, we want this to be an amazing experience for our children. Or for some of the staff members, we want this to be an amazing experience for our grandchildren. The people that are interviewing to teach in our school now are the 20-somethings that now have gone through classical schools and now are receding new schools. And that's really exciting. And I think that's something that the ACCS should be really proud of. I like to say that we're standing on the shoulders of giants and I get to see the view from up here and it's really beautiful. I think the greatest evidence for God's hand in classical Christian education are the schools that exist right now. Classical Christian education goes with the way God designed humans to work, to learn. We've got a long way to go. We want to improve in everything we're doing. We don't have it down, but we're learning. That's what a school should be. The school should love learning as an institution. This whole thing is very much a God thing. And the perennial temptation throughout history, you see it in scripture, is God blesses, God gives great gifts, and then the people forget. Don't ever forget how many blessings God has poured out on us. And don't ever forget what he did to bring us to this point. Going through an ACCS school is kind of like being a trust fund kid. You're being given a massive inheritance. You're being given wealth you cannot begin to comprehend, and hopefully which you will not squander. I cannot imagine giving my kids any other kind of education. And I am incredibly grateful to be benefiting from the work of the generation before me and to have the generation after me benefiting even more. We think you have the most important job in the world, raising your kids well. Most important job in the world for the kingdom of God, for the future of our country, uh, for the sanity of Moscow, Idaho, or wherever you live, for your own household. Raising kids is a timed event with eternal consequences. So God says, okay, on your marks, get set, go.